years have seen a real upsurge in the feminist movement in the UK, and it's been hugely exciting to see this happen. But something else has been gaining ground in recent decades, um, and that I believe threatens the very precious gains that we've made for women's equality, both here and around the world. And that is the rise of the global sex trade. Now, during the 1990s, the number of men who pay for sex in the UK doubled. Lap dancing clubs increased tenfold between 1997 and 2011. And today, over 90% of children have seen online pornography before they reach their 14th birthday. All of which leaves us in uncharted territory as a society. And it also poses some big questions for us. For example, isn't it just a woman's individual choice if she wants to strip for money? Could porn be warping the generation, um, warping the attitudes of a generation of boys? And what laws, if any, should we be applying to the prostitution trade? Now, these are all questions which I sought to find answers for in Pimp State, but it's the final question, how should the law react to prostitution that I'm gonna focus on today? Now, when it comes to prostitution, it's previously been estimated that around 80,000 people are involved in the UK. Most of them are women. Now, in, in, um, in opposition to that, it's overwhelmingly men who pay for sex. And today, the figure is at around one in 10 men who have paid for sex. Now, there is extensive evidence to show that for those women who become involved in prostitution, the vast majority are extremely vulnerable before their involvement and also experience acute harms whilst in the trade. So, for example, it's previously been estimated that 50% of women in prostitution in the UK became involved whilst they were still children. So it began as child sexual exploitation and it continued. Of women in street prostitution, Again, half have experienced rape or sexual assault. Most of these assaults committed by sex buyers. And an international study which looked at people's experience of prostitution found that nine out of 10 people in prostitution say they want to get out, but feel unable to do so. So, how should the government respond? An increasingly popular reply to that question is full decriminalization. What that means is that the government removes all laws specifically restricting the prostitution trade and third party profiteering from it. It is now advocated by institutions such as UNAIDS uh, and billionaire financier George Soros's Open Society Foundations. And it leaves me wondering, do these institutions, these groups, really realize what they're asking for by calling for full decriminalization? A quick note on terminology, which I think is worth uh, pointing out. You'll hear very few people call for the sex trade to be legalized. An example of a country that has what dubbed a legalized prostitution regime is Germany, and this is where the state imposes some restrictions on the prostitution trade. So, for example, restricting uh, local authorities can put restrictions on where brothels set up. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of state regulation of it. Now, groups such as the Open Society Foundations will hold up um, an alternative, which is called full decriminalization. And New Zealand is a country that is often pointed to and held up as an example to all other countries for what we should do. But when, when you hear that uh, New Zealand held up in that way, I think it's important to remember that New Zealand doesn't actually meet this, the definition supposedly, supposedly of what a fully decriminalized prostitution regime would be. Um, 
For example, in New Zealand, uh, local authorities can restrict where brothels operate, they can restrict prostitution advertising, and women in prostitution can actually be criminalized for not practice, practicing safer sex. So often the distinction which is held up between countries, between a legalized regime and a fully decriminalized regime, are not accurate. But confusing application of terminology aside, personally, I can't quite decide which in principle would be worse. A fully decriminalized regime where the government takes on a total laissez-faire approach, puts its hands up and says, no, we'll leave pimps and brothel keepers to it. Or where the state says, okay, we'll sanction it, but we'll, we'll, help, we'll make sure you do it right. So the state is legitimating the prostitution trade. But regardless of whether it's dubbed full decriminalization or legalization, what unites both of these regimes is firstly, that they don't even attempt to reduce demand for the prostitution trade. They take the trade as a given. And then secondly, they make brothel keeping and pimping legal. Which brings, brings me back to my question. Do all those advocating this approach, supposedly in the name of human rights, seriously realize what they are asking for? Because let's take a look at what's happened in those countries that have tried it. Germany, for instance. They took the decision in 2001 um, to legalize the prostitution trade. And today, they are host to chains of mega brothels. For example, Paradise in Stuttgart um, cost over 6 million euros to build and has 31 private rooms for the paying customers. The image here behind me is of another brothel called Pasha, which dwarfs Paradise with um, 12 stories. Now, when I was researching Pimp State, I went to uh, another brothel, which wouldn't probably meet the, the qualifications of a, of a mega brothel, but it was a multi-story brothel, and I was taken there by a local support service who run a cafe, it's called La Strada Cafe, where women can essentially have time out from the brothels, get some food, but also, crucially, access support services, and even when, they, when and if they want it, help to exit the trade. Now, one of the social workers there took me into this brothel. It was a four-story brothel, and each floor had multiple, very small rooms leading off it. We went from room to room, and the worker that I was with was letting the women know that there was a doctor coming to the cafe who they could go and see that night. And as we went from room to room, it became clear that none of the women spoke German as a first language. They were all from Eastern Europe, and they were all very, very young. From the age of 18, which is the legal bottom limit, um, and not much older than 20. And the woman who was taking me around this explained to me that all of the women there, they worked and they slept and they lived in those rooms in the brothels. And this is part of the legal, legalized prostitution regime. Then there's New Zealand, which is held up as the, as the promised land of, of prostitution regimes, who in 2003 so-called fully decriminalized prostitution regime, so making pimping and brothel, brothel keeping legal, supposedly in the interests of women. This was supposed to make women safer. But an official review carried out in 2008 surveyed women in brothels and found that in the previous 12 months alone, 38% in these so-called managed brothels felt they had to accept a client when they didn't want to, and 3% had been raped by a sex buyer. Now, the justification for calling for decriminalization or legalization of prostitution is often that the suggestion that by recognizing prostitution as work, as a legitimate trade, women can therefore access 
critical rights and protections by virtue of being recognised as a worker. And the key that's held up as unlocking these rights um, is employment contracts. So brothels issuing contracts to the women in them. Turns out that in those the, the countries I've mentioned, most women don't actually want a contract from a brothel keeper, and the brothels don't want to issue them either. So uh, an evaluation carried out in 2007 in Germany found that just 1% of women in prostitution had a, an employment contract, and only 6% actually wanted one. So, and that's important because it means that the basic workplace health and safety protections that operate in Germany don't apply to these women in the brothels because they're not employees. In New Zealand, it was a similar picture. Their evaluation found that the standard position was that women were categorised as independent contractors. They rent rooms in the brothels, so they have to see a certain number of men before they'll even break even. And that means that women are not just um, denied basic employment entitlements, like sick pay, they are laden with legal obligations under health and safety rules and tax rules. And as the evaluation itself pointed out, failure to comply with these can have serious financial consequences for these women. Added to all of this, there is international research sh that shows that those countries where prostitution is completely legal have significantly higher rates of trafficking. So legalized and fully decriminalized prostitution regimes have repeatedly been shown to fail, even on their own terms, of preventing harms attendant to the prostitution trade, like pimping and trafficking. On the contrary, they've been shown to magnify them. But fundamentally, these approaches don't even attempt to tackle what the harm that is inherent to prostitution. Because what the sex trade boils down to is that a man can pay to sexually access the body of a woman who doesn't freely want to have sex with him. And he knows that's the case, otherwise he wouldn't have to pay her to be there. So this isn't just a regular consumer transaction, this is sexual abuse. He's, he has to disregard mutuality in that situation. His ability to treat her and view her as a sex object are fundamental to the act. But that demand for the sex trade is not inevitable. It is driven by a sense of entitlement among sex buyers, which I, I heard when I spent a day listening to them talking to me on the phone about why they do it, and also through the research that's been done with men and their, their experiences of paying for sex. It's an entitlement that can be challenged. And there is a legal approach to prostitution that does exactly that. And that is called the sex buyer law, or Nordic model. It is designed to end the demand which underpins the global prostitution trade. It recognizes prostitution for what it is, sexual exploitation, and it has three core components. The first is that paying for sex is criminalized. Secondly, selling sex is completely decriminalized because the last thing that you do when someone is being exploited is punish them for it. But then thirdly, it provides for support and exiting services for those who want to leave the sex trade. This is a picture of a woman called Rosen Hercher, who I had the great privilege of meeting during the course of my research. Rosen walked 800 kilometers across France in 2014, calling on her government to adopt the sex buyer law. She started in a town near Bordeaux, a town which was the first place that she ever was paid for sex. And she ended in Paris, the last place she was paid for sex. And due to the efforts of women like Rosen, in April this year, France adopted the sex buyer law. And they now join Northern Ireland and also Iceland, Norway and Sweden in having it. Those last three countries be, being three of the four countries with the top ratings for gender equality worldwide. The reason they've adopted it because there is significant evidence that as having a sex buyer law discourages demand 
changes public attitudes and makes the country in question a more hostile destination for traffickers. Now, in responding to the rise of the global sex trade, we have to see through the myths that surround it. Myths like demand for prostitution is inevitable, that porn is merely fantasy, or that sex buyers are just regular consumers. Because only then can we begin to tackle the sexist attitudes that underpin it, and so build a world in which women and men can live as equals. Thank you.